Is the Achilles heel the loan guarantees? That's often raised, that if those $10 billion in loan guarantees could be revoked, Israel would be forced to... No, I don't think so. Israel is a wealthy country. You know, it's now ranked, I think, something like the top 18 uh, uh, countries in the world in terms of living standards. If you look Forbes magazine about, uh, I think it was last year, it did a survey of um, how people, how happy people feel in various countries. And in Israel, Israel ranked its population as the eighth happiest country on earth. Yes, it's true, they're very happy. It's a very good life uh, for most of them. It's a very good life. Uh, and the challenge now, I don't think, is withholding loan guarantees. It's not even withholding military support because that's not really going to happen. The challenge is uh, making Israel feel very uncomfortable about the policies it carries on. Uh, it's sort of as Professor Saeed once said about uh, the apartheid movement, he asked the second, the person second in charge in the ANC, a fellow by the name of Walter Sisulu, he asked Walter Sisulu, well, how did you achieve the dismantling of apartheid? He said our main achievement was to turn apartheid into a dirty word in the world. And I'm sure everybody here, roughly in my age cohort, you remember that when, even I remember when I was 10 years old, literally, I'm watching on TV golf, and there was a team on TV, some of the older people will remember, it was Arnold Palmer, Palmer and Gary Player. They had a TV program. How many people remember Arnold Palmer, Gary Player program? Oh, yeah, actually quite a few. It was a popular program. And they would say, Arnold Palmer, everyone loved Arnie, and Gary Player, and they would say, he's from South Africa. Now, I didn't know anything about politics, but I remember my skin would crawl. I knew there was something wrong about that place, South Africa. And I didn't like Gary Player. <laughs> he was a handsome young man, and he seemed perfectly charming, and he was teamed up with Arnie, but I don't like him. There is something wrong with that South Africa place. And that's kind of what we have to do. We have to convey the message such that every Israeli feels it that we don't like what's going on. And also, it's true, some, to some extent, we have to show that their bread is no longer going to be buttered. And if your bread is not buttered, you very quickly get into line. How that exactly works, uh, I can't say. Uh, I think, you know, there it's a formula for organizers, and I confess to my limitations. I'm not an organizer, but I do believe something that would be very useful now is if we organize a, a good lobby in Washington, a lobby under the simple slogan, enforce the law. And if you travel the country as I do, uh, this audience is not really representative of it, but the college students, what are called the SJPs, the Students for Justice in Palestine, and the MSAs, the Muslim Student Associations, they're filled with really very remarkable, very impressive, very smart, very energetic young people. And I think you get them in Washington, you get them on Capitol Hill, they'll do internships from their universities. I think they can give the lobby a run for its money. Uh, I, I think it would be a very exciting development because the lobby has never felt an opposition. The other side has been, so to speak, our side, has been very weak and very inept. I think a good lobby armed with those powerful weapons, which I do think are powerful, I'm sort of old-fashioned, the weapons of truth and justice, I think they can get places. Okay, it's true like Chris says, 
A lot of Congress is corrupt. But you know, there are a lot of people, maybe, who just don't know what's going on. They really do only hear one side. And then there is another category of people who do know, but since they're not confronted with the other side, they're not really shamed. And you can shame or embarrass them. So there are the those who are genuinely ignorant, who genuinely buy the propaganda. There are those who haven't been confronted in such a way as to embarrass them and shame them. I don't know how big a number that is, I confess. But I think if we put together a good lobby, uh, we may discover that there are quite a lot of people there who we can win. Uh, it's a struggle, but I think it's a struggle that's now winnable. Times have just dramatically changed, and most people in this room seem old enough to know that. Twenty years ago, Israeli Defense Force members, they used to be paraded on college campuses, and they were celebrated by Jewish students for their heroism, and they were fighters which American Jews surged with pride at the thought of. Nowadays, the campus Hillels, they drag these Israeli soldiers on college campuses, but not to be celebrated as fighters, but to try to convince the Jewish students that they're not war criminals. It's very different. And the truth be told, they're not convincing anyone. In fact, if you look at the meetings as I have, very few Jewish students even show up. It's usually nearly an empty room. There is a vacuum there waiting to be filled. And I think we can fill it. If we're both principled and reasonable, and we have to also be reasonable, or we're not going to win many people. One of the problems that those of us who care about creating a just solution face is the deterioration in the Palestinian leadership itself. Mm -hmm. The first story I covered in 1988 on the West Bank was the Jordanian withdrawal and the Israelis were celebrating the removal of the dreaded King Hussein. Then they made war against that East Jerusalem aristocratic class, Faisal Husseini, discrediting, marginalizing them. Then they destroyed the PLO and Arafat, who had been, I think, in, in good faith a negotiating partner. Uh, we, we ended up with Hamas, um, a pretty repugnant organization. Uh, how does one cope with the radicalization and deterioration within the Palestinian leadership itself and let's of course acknowledge that the PA has even under Arafat been a traditionally corrupt and largely dysfunctional leadership entity. Well there are two issues and there are separate issues. One issue is has any significant component of the Palestinian leadership been significantly an obstacle to resolving the conflict. And there the answer to my thinking based on looking at the record, the answer is no. Whether or not you like Hamas, the fact of the matter is that Hamas has in recent years, in particular since its winning of the election, the parliamentary election in 2006, Hamas has repeatedly said it's willing to accept the settlement on the June 1967 border. It echoes the same terms of the United Nations General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, and so forth. And so if you look at has either side, or I should say either a major component of the Palestinian leadership, whether Hamas or the Palestinian Authority, have they blocked a settlement? 
I think the answer is clearly and unambiguously no. But there's a second question. Have they pursued a strategy that's likely to mobilize the Palestinian population? Because in the absence of mobilizing the population in order to end the occupation, it's very unlikely that anything we do can bring about an end to the conflict. At the end of the day, the biggest resource the Palestinian people have is the Palestinian people. Four million of those people mobilized and challenging Israel in its daily enforcements of the occupation. If you mobilize them, organize them, I think, it would take me some time to demonstrate it, but I think I can, uh, they can defeat the Israeli occupation, of course, with our support. We have to be clear about that. And that's possible. I had dinner the other evening with the Indian writer Arundhati Roy, and she makes the perfectly, or made the perfectly obvious point, because she's constantly under assault for supporting what are called the Maoists in India. And she says, look, when you live, when you have people living in an obscure corner of the planet, Nobody's paying attention to them. Nobody could care less whether they're living or dead. And the Indian government in this case comes in and commits the most horrendous and horrific atrocities. To talk about nonviolence in that context is simply nonsense. It will never work because if the cameras are away, the Indian government will carry on the way any government with power carries on in order to preserve its power and its privilege. But the case of Palestine is different because of, for various historical reasons, the cameras don't turn away from it. In fact, the cameras stay focused on it. And if we do our share here to publicize that the Palestinians are not asking for the stars, the moon, and the sky, when they march, when they demonstrate, as they do daily in various parts of the West Bank to protest the illegal wall that Israel has been building, they're just asking for their rights under international law. If we do our share to clarify what's going on, and they do, or I should say, assume the much bigger burden of being on the front lines. Yes, it's true. Israel will kill them. We'll kill quite a lot of them. But I think well short of a massacre, the sorts of massacres that occur in those obscure zones of India, for example, well short of those massacres, they will be forced to stop. They can't do it. Not because they're nice people. Uh, and not because, incidentally, they're worse than others. But because, if we can use that expression, which I think is a valid expression, international public opinion won't tolerate it. And the more we're organized, the less public opinion will tolerate it, and the sooner Israel will be forced to desist. Again, not attributing any kind of special humane qua humanity to the Israelis. That's the fact of politics. They can't do it. Uh, that's the world in which we live. Uh, and if I, so I think the tactic can work, but it depends on mobilizing the Palestinians, and neither of the main Palestinian political factions 
for various reasons, are ready to do that. And that's, I think, the problem. But we should not confuse that with the fact that the Palestinians are not an obstacle to resolving the conflict. Everyone is ready except the Israelis.